gospel is in the gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 9th verse. Would you stand, please, for the reading of the Holy Gospel? To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. <clears throat> now, what I'm about to tell you will set the scene for my sermon this morning. So listen. In 1971, there was a fantasy movie starring Gene Wilder as Willy Wonka in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, one of my favorites. Its theme was greed and selfishness and told the story of a poor little boy named Charlie Bucket. Now, Charlie lived in a small house with his parents and all four of his grandparents on the edge of an unnamed English town. And Charlie wanted nothing more than to make his family happy. They were very poor. They didn't have much to eat, which accounted for Charlie's small size. However, Charlie had developed a yearning for chocolate because every day he had to walk past Mr. Wonka's chocolate factory on his way to and from school. And it was said that Willy Wonka made the perfect candy bar because of the brand of chocolate he used. Well, one day, Mr. Wonka announced he had hidden five golden tickets in five of his Wonka chocolate bars that he had shipped all over the world to find someone worthy enough to assume control of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory when he retired. Well, Charlie had a chocolate bar. He bit into it, felt something, pulled it out of his mouth. It was the edge of a ticket. Charlie had found his golden ticket just in time to tour the factory the next day. So he ran home, grabbed his grandpa Joe. Together they sang a little song, I've Got a Golden Ticket. And five children from around the world took their golden tickets to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And when they got there, they signed a contract with him that they would have a lifetime supply of chocolate. But the story goes on. Some lost that contract. How? Because they broke the rules. They got into trouble. They had to end their tours early and go home. Why, listen, Augustus Gloop was an oversized, snobbish boy, very greedy. He was the first to be eliminated by reason of his being too impatient and eager. And the other three children, just, they were just as greedy and selfish. 
Each child wanted to take possession of something they believed they were entitled to because they had a golden ticket. But during his factory tour, Charlie saw everything Mr. Walker showed him with excitement and delight, and he held tightly to Grandpa Joe's hand. He followed every direction of Mr. Wonka. And when Charlie was the only child left, Mr. Wonka told Charlie he was the one who would inherit his chocolate factory when he retired. So Charlie and his family all went to Mr. Wonka's chocolate factory and lived, and it ended their family's poverty. They were never hungry again. And the plot of this story, Charlie Walker and the Chocolate Factory, divides people into two categories. Those who are wealthy and those who are not. It suggests that wealth, or the lack of it, isn't everything in life. And that's the point of our lesson. You see, a lot of people today think that just because they have a golden ticket in life, they're entitled. A lot of people think that way about their religion, believe it or not. They think they have a contract with God that gives them certain things. And this isn't new. It's been around a long time. And that's why Jesus told this parable today about the prayers of two men. And if you were listening closely to the reading of this gospel, you heard the golden ticket thinking of one man's prayer. Listen again. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Why, I fast twice a week. And I give a tenth of all I get. But that tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's quite a contrast, isn't it? Imagine how people heard that in Jesus' day. Both types of men were well known to the people, the Jewish people. The Pharisee, why, he was a religious leader. He was an example of leadership among all the Jews. But that tax collector, well, he probably wasn't a Jew. And as a tax collector, he would probably have been not liked. But as a tax collector, he was very unpopular. The Jews saw him working for the emperor of Rome to help oppress the Jewish people. And the Jews who heard this parable would have assumed that the hero of this story was the Pharisee. And the tax collector, he was the enemy. They were more comfortable with that Pharisee's prayer and would have agreed with his claim of righteousness and spiritual superior, superiority. But not the tax collector. They would have been appalled by the tax collector even being in the temple. They would have thought him foolish to even offer a word of prayer to their Jehovah God. But Jesus showed them that the golden ticket thinking of that Pharisee was wrong. It was a tax collector who was justified before God. And there are a lot of people like that Pharisee today. They think they have a lock on God because they are sure they belong to the right religious group. They're guaranteed a seat at God's table. Well, those Jewish people bragged, I belong to the tribe of Judah. That was one of the 12 tribes of Israel named after Judah, the son of Jacob. It was the first tribe to take its place in the promised land. There are others who said, 
I'm from the line of Abraham. <clears throat> God appeared to Abraham when he was 99 years old, Mitch, and promised him that he would produce many children, many descendants, that Abraham would be the father of many nations, and kings would descend from him. Those Jews were sure they belonged to God's elect because being a child of Abraham made them holy. They had their golden ticket. But the problem was that Pharisee was too self-righteous. He saw everyone's sin but his own. He didn't go to the temple to pray to God. He went to the temple to remind God of how good he was and how bad everybody else was. I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like that tax collector. Let me ask you, do you pray like that Pharisee? I'm not like others. Or do you pray like the tax collector, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It wasn't a loud prayer like the Pharisee. And it wasn't a challenging prayer. It was just a simple prayer. You could barely hear it when he said it. But that seven-word prayer was full of humility. It was about the way life really was. I'm not fit to stand before you, God. I'm not worthy to even be speaking to you. I have no ground to stand on. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You see, prayers should come from an humble heart. Not a, presump a presumptuous one. Not self-important. Not expecting something. Just God. Have mercy on me, a sinner. A college girl visited the home of Ludwig von Beethoven in Bonn, Germany. He was one of the world's greatest musicians. And she slipped under the rope that kept people away from Beethoven's piano, and she began to play it. And the guard came over, and she said to the guard, I suppose every musician who comes here wants to play this piano. He said, well, the great Paderewski, who enjoyed success after success as a pianist, statesman, composer, he was visiting here. And someone asked him to play that same piano you're playing. And he said, no, I do not feel worthy to play the great master's piano. Now that's humility. I'm not worthy to play that piano. The Pharisee in this story, this parable, built himself up by tearing others down. He compared himself with that tax collector to make himself look good. He judged the tax collector to raise his own self-worth. How many times have you done the same thing? How many times have you looked at someone and said, I'm not like that person? Do you look at others and say, I come to church every Sunday. I tithe. I'm on a church committee. Why? I donate my time to the food pantry. Now look over there. They only come to church on Easter and Christmas. They never do anything for the church. What sinners they are. Well, listen. If you think like that, this parable is for you. It frees you from having to judge others. Remember, 
It's not all the good things you do that make you righteous before God. It's not tithing. It's not working on a church committee. It's not being busy doing churchy things. No. It's when you have no defense for your sin. And there's no way out. It's when you recognize you are saved by God's grace alone. And then you are left with nothing else to say. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Your faith doesn't make you better than others. You're a sinner just like them. You're just like the tax collector. You're saved and you're forgiven only by what Jesus did for you on the cross. So bow down before him. Receive the gift he offers you. He's given you a golden ticket that's called eternal life by his death on the cross. When you're willing to trust God with openness and humility, then you will receive all he has to offer you. The gift of eternal life. You don't have to work for it. You only have to ask for it. So go forth from this place this morning in faith, determined to be among those who have received God's gift of everlasting life. And all you had to do was humbly say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Amen.